Welcome to LG Ministry. I'm so thankful that you have joined me today to hear another lesson from God's Word. I always do my best to present the truth and I hope the lessons that I present to you will challenge you or it will cause you to be uplifted so that you might grow closer to God. So now let's get to our lesson. A significant event occurred in our history in the West in 1848. James Wilson Marshall made a discovery at Sutter's Mill in California that would profoundly affect the people in our country and in California itself. As a result of his finds, San Francisco grew from a small town to a city of 25,000 in one year. Prices for food and lodging soared. Men and women across the country suffered hardship, disease, hunger, and even death making the trek to California. However, those who survived made as much as 5,000 in three days. As a result of the massive flood of people to this area, California was admitted to the Union as a state in 1850. The discovery was gold and the event was the California Gold Rush of 1849. The news of gold and the possibility of making it rich was just too tempting for people. Ever since gold was discovered, humans have indulged in it, treasured it, hoarded it, and fought for it and even died for it. The Egyptians went so far as to identify gold with the gods because it reminded them of the sun. So to merely say that humans are fascinated by gold is an understatement. I wish everyone would desire the Word of God as much as they do gold and other priceless treasures. Think about how our world would be if everyone were willing to indulge in, fight for, and even die for the Word of God. After all, is not the Word of God a golden treasure? To be more specific, there is a teaching of Christ that we have linked with the word gold. Matthew 7, verse number 12. Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. This saying of Jesus has been appropriately labeled the golden rule. But why is it called this? First of all, it's considered as being very beautiful. This message is so brilliant that it surpasses the brilliance of gold. This principle of this message is easy for everyone to understand and apply to their lives. This simple message demands fairness, justice, equality, and empathy. This simple teaching also influenced and had power over the Roman Emperor Alexander Severus. History teaches us that he greatly admired this rule, and he had it written on the walls of his closet. He quoted it when he was giving his judgment and honored Christ and favored Christians for the sake of it. Not only was the golden rule taught by Christianity, its principles have been found in just about every corrupt religion as well. For instance, Islam, no one of you is a believer until he desires for his brother that which he desires for himself. Taoism, which is a collection of Chinese philosophy and tradition, Regard your neighbor's gain as your own gain and your neighbor's loss as your own loss. Judaism, what is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow man. That is the entire law. All the rest is commentary. Buddhism, hurt not others in ways that you yourself would find hurtful. Now I want you to think about this. If everyone decided to follow the golden rule, it would completely change our world. There would be no more crime, no more prison cells, no gas chambers, and no electric chairs. Discrimination, prejudice, and all other forms of racial hatred and bigotry would cease. The nightly news wouldn't be able to report on terrorist attacks or the hijacking of planes, kidnappings, bombings, or other forms of violence. Instead, all these things would be reminders of our past. And we could see how we had overcome our wickedness by following the golden rule. The golden rule is a great summary of how we should treat our fellow man. Now let's take a closer look at the golden rule. The first point I want to make is that the conduct of the world is in contrast to Christ's teaching. It has been said that there are four 
rules by which we live. Number one, the iron rule. Number two, the brass rule. Number three, the silver rule. And number four, the golden rule. Although we are primarily concerned about the golden rule, I want to briefly discuss these other rules. The iron rule is based on the brutal and satanic principle of might makes it right. Cain was the first to practice the iron rule when he stained his hands with the innocent blood of his brother Abel. Every murder from then on until now and every war that has ever been fought has been a direct result of the iron rule principle. Adolf Hitler loved this philosophy. He attempted to build a superior human race and he wanted to weed out those he considered to be weak. So he enforced the iron rule and started murdering those who didn't fit in his concept. The iron rule also states, what is yours is mine if I can take it by force. The Old Testament kings Ahab and David are two prime examples of iron ruled followers. Ahab coveted Naboth's vineyard and obtained it by force, 1 Kings 21, and David took another man's wife in the same way, 2 Samuel chapter 11. There are many today who follow the iron rule. An FBI statistic in 2018 reveals that there were 1.2 million violent crimes in the United States, with 66.9% of that number being aggravated assault and 1.3% being murders. All those who committed these violent crimes all live by the iron rule. However, a person doesn't have to be a thief or a murderer to, or to have this type of mentality. Because 1 John 3.15 says, Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. So if you hate your brothers or sisters in Christ, you live by the iron rule. Also, if a person has the Diotrephes complex of 3 John 1 and verses 9 through 10, and you try to be the supreme ruler, you are living by the iron rule. Now let's take a look at the brass rule. The brass rule is the get even philosophy. It says, do unto others as they do unto you. I will treat you as you treat me, good for good, evil for evil. This idea is both defended and practiced by many in the world because they want to be this way. They want to get revenge. And sometimes you can find it in the church. The scriptures clearly denounce such an attitude. Romans 12 verse 14, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Romans 12 verse 17, repay no one evil for evil, have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourself, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. These things are not easy to do, yet that's what the Bible teaches. The silver rule is the rule of Confucius, which says, Do nothing unto others that you would not have them do unto you. Halil, the great Jewish rabbi, taught the same concept. This is a negative rule that requires no good acts of mankind. This law forbids a person from murdering his neighbor, but it also doesn't require them to help their neighbor. There are many who call themselves Christians who follow the silver rule. They stay out of mischief, but they don't do any good. Some are like the rich young ruler of Matthew chapter 19. They don't murder, commit adultery, steal, bear false witness, and so on. But on the other hand, they don't do any good acts to help others. They don't lift any loads. They don't bear any burdens. They are like the priest and the Levite and the story of the Good Samaritan who passed by the man needing their help. They don't really do any harm to him, but again, they don't help him either. You know, there is no place in the life of a Christian for the iron, silver, or brass rule. As Christians, we should live our lives by the golden rule and consistently practice it. So we must learn to deal with others as we would like others to deal with us. Now let's consider the context in which the golden rule is found. When Jesus was baptized by John and he began his ministry, he enlisted men who would become his apostles. In order for the apostles' work to be effective, they would have to be instructed by Jesus so they would know how to live their lives and teach others how to live according to God's word. One of the greatest lessons they received was when Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 through chapter 7. Of course, this was really not that long of a sermon, but man is it powerful. In fact, 
It only takes about 15 minutes to read it out loud. This shows you that a sermon doesn't have to be long in order to make powerful points. A great example of this comes from our own history. On November 19, 1863, two men came to Pennsylvania to dedicate a Union cemetery. One was Edward Everett and the other was Abraham Lincoln. Everett spoke first and spoke for one hour and 15 minutes. However, Lincoln only spoke a grand total of two minutes. History doesn't remember much about Everett's speech, but it will never forget Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. The same can be said for the Sermon on the Mount. There have certainly been longer sermons given, but the world will never forget the Sermon on the Mount. Neither should we. It's short, simple, sincere, and to the point. The lessons it teach are superb. It is filled with beauty, imagery, and has a powerful conclusion. The Sermon on the Mount tells us what it means to truly be righteous. It teaches that one cannot substitute hypocrisy with the truth as the scribes and the Pharisees had been doing. The key to this grand sermon is found in Matthew 6 and verse number 8, which basically says, do not be like them. Of course, the Sermon on the Mount includes our golden text in Matthew 7 verse 12. Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. While others say, don't, Jesus says, do. Jesus gave us this positive command so that we could do our best to have a positive and meaningful influence on other people. When we examine the golden rule, we must keep this verse in context. Notice our verse starts out using therefore. Jesus is summing up what he had taught in the previous 11 verses. In these verses, Jesus taught us about not rendering unjust judgment and teaches us about the proper attitude we should have when giving to others. This is why it's so important that we let the golden rule be our God in our daily lives. For instance, when it comes to being judged, I want to be given the benefit of the doubt. Therefore, since I'm guided by the golden rule, I'm going to give others the benefit of the doubt. I want to be considered innocent until proven guilty. Therefore, I'll consider others innocent until proven guilty. I don't want others jumping to conclusions about me and uh, without having the facts. Therefore, I won't jump to conclusions about others without having the facts. In essence, the golden rule teaches me that just as I want others to have a proper attitude towards me, I'll have a proper attitude towards them. Not only is this verse related to the context of Matthew chapter 7, it also relates to all the scriptures because the basic principle of this saying can be used in virtually every one of life situations. It causes us to put ourselves in other people's shoes and to ask ourselves, if I were them, how would I like to be treated? Now, once we answer that question in our minds, then we must act accordingly. Now, the golden rule is limited by the will of God. In other words, we cannot abuse this saying in any way that would go against what the rest of the Bible teaches. For instance, if I said, I want someone to lie, cheat, and steal from me, therefore, since I'm guided by the golden rule, I will lie, cheat, and steal for them. Any interpretation like this would violate God's teaching as recorded elsewhere. So we can only apply the golden rule as long as it is in harmony with the rest of the Bible. Another thing I want to point out about the golden rule is that it is a rule and not a suggestion. It is not a take it or leave it situation. It is a command that is just as binding as any other command. As Jesus said in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you love Jesus, you will treat others as you want to be treated in harmony with God's word. Several years ago, a lady was murdered on a New York City street. The people who lived in the area heard her screams, but they ignored them. Her attacker came and left several times, but the neighbors pulled down their windows to avoid hearing her cries. They refused to get involved. They didn't even call the police. Had they been in her situation, they would have wanted help. And so this poor lady would probably be alive today if her neighbors had practiced the golden rule. Jesus has a much higher standard by which he wants his people to be guided. Just think about what would happen if we all had a heavy dose of the golden rule in our homes, congregations, and in our society. Think of the difference it would make in our world if people lived by the golden rule. It would make our nation and our world be at peace with one another. Think about how wonderful our families would be if we could live by this rule. 
There would be no need for arguing and fighting because we would always consider the other person and not treat them poorly. We could certainly use this golden rule in the church because too many congregations have split over stupid stuff that had nothing to do with doctrine. If the golden rule had been practiced, many divisions would have never happened. That is how powerful the golden rule can be if we will practice it in our lives. To reap the benefits of the golden rule, you have to be willing to commit yourself to live by it. The question becomes, are you willing to make the commitment? Will you be considerate of others? Will you treat others as you would like to be treated? We need to think about how others are affected by our speech and our actions. We should ask ourselves, would I like to be treated that way? Or would I rather be treated some other way? You know, far too many are like the little girl who was guilty of telling on her brother and her sister. When asked if she would like others to tattle on her, she replied, no, that wouldn't be any fun. When asked why she constantly tattled, she answered, because that is fun. Although most can see the immaturity of this little girl, sometimes as Christians we fail to see the immaturity and inconsideration in our own lives. We always want to be given the benefit of the doubt and to be considered innocent until proven guilty, but sometimes we are the ones who jump to conclusions when it comes to the actions and attitudes of others. We want others to be patient with us whenever we're trying to overcome our faults in our lives, but do we offer other people that same amount of patience? I think we would all want people to come and speak to us directly if we have wronged them or sinned in some way, rather than spreading it throughout the community. But do we do the right thing when it comes to others? We often expect the best from everyone else, but do we expect the best from ourselves? Living the golden rule and showing consideration toward others would put an end to suspicions, evil speaking, gossip, backbiting, abuse, harsh and unjust criticism, and so on. We may also discover that the more that we consider of what others are thinking and, and try to take their position, then the more considerate they are going to be of us. Another good question is, will you be consistent in your lifestyle? We want others to set good examples, and we should do likewise, realizing that Christianity is not limited to the first day of the week. One of the strongest speeches Jesus gave that pointed out the hypocrisy of the scribes and Pharisees is found in Matthew chapter 23. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do, but do not do according to their works, for they say and do not do. This was the main problem with the scribes and Pharisees. They were unwilling to practice what they preached. And since they did not live by what they preached, Jesus called them hypocrites seven times in this chapter alone. God demands that his people be consistent and practice what they preach. So let us do our best to be consistent in the words we use. We should not praise a person to their face and then stab them in the back when they're not looking. Consistency in our speech will help eliminate slander and other sins of the tongue. We should be consistent at all times and at all places, whether on Sundays, Saturdays, or any day of the week. I hope we can all learn to be consistent like the Apostle Paul and say what he said to the Galatians. In Galatians 2 verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. If you're going to be able to live by the golden rule, then there are going to be times when you'll have to fight against the pride that is in your life. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you is very difficult for the self-centered, the conceited, and the proud egotist. Those with this these type of characteristics will have difficulty applying the golden rule because people like this only think of themselves. And their favorite, favorite words are I, me, mine, and myself. If we ever hope to live by the golden rule, we must eliminate pride from our lives. We must have a selfless and not a selfish attitude. And we must have the mind of Christ. Paul put it this way, Philippians 2, verse 2, Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. 
Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. How pure is the golden rule in your life? Is it solid gold? 18 karat gold? Maybe 10 karat gold? Or is it simply gold that's overlaid? Or is it fool's gold? We can purify the golden rule in our lives by being considerate of others, by being consistent in our lifestyle, and by confronting and combating pride in our lives. Make no mistake, gold is a valuable ore. It is worth several hundred dollars per ounce. However, the golden rule is a principle that you can't begin to value or put a price tag on. The 21 words found in the golden rule teach a principle that no amount of money can ever buy. Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. I sure do appreciate you listening to my lesson today. I hope that you found it something that is biblical, something that was encouraging, or maybe again challenged you to change your life, or just maybe gave you something to think about. I think it's so important that we listen and that we study God's Word as much as we can. Now, one thing I want to be clear on is I want you to never take my word at just because I say it so. Now, I do my best to study God's Word, and I try to make sure that I'm always presenting the truth. But I am just a man. I can make mistakes. So compare what I say to God's Word. If you do that, you can't go wrong. And if you find that I'm teaching something that is incorrect, I mean, you can turn to Scripture and you can say, look what it says here please contact me and let me know because I'm very concerned. I want to make sure that I am proclaiming the truth. Another thing that you can do that will be helpful to you is you can go on YouTube. You can search out LG Ministry and you can look for my videos there as well. And you will find, I don't know, it's over like, I think it's close to 500 videos now or more. But there will be many lessons that you can continue to watch and you continue to grow from. Please let people know about this so that other people can see the truth taught. Again, I hope you have a wonderful day, and I hope that you continue to run the race and to remain faithful to God until the day that you die.